Welcome, everyone. So we're discussing, I think, extremely important topic of harnessing uh, our human capital in Africa and developing that in the future. And I thought I would just initially ask each panelist to introduce themselves uh, very succinctly. Um, I'm uh, Chief Investment Officer of Silver Street Capital. We focused on investing in Africa's agricultural sector. We're the largest private equity investor into the sector and have investments across eight countries in southern and East Africa. Our primary focus is on fixing problems in value chains. And uh, because such a large part of the agricultural sector is smallholder farmer, um, we're looking at unlocking um, these, these value chains. Um, and for example, raising yields on smallholder farmers. So we're investing in inputs, seed sector, providing inputs, also manufacturing, processing, so providing a market for smallholder farmers supporting farmers in training and so on to raise their yields. But I'll hand over um, one by one. So first over to Wayne, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself, thanks. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Wayne Hennessy Barrett, I'm founder CEO of 4G Capital. We're a fintech lender providing last mile finance solutions uh, to help distributors and brands grow their sales by providing the working capital blended with enterprise training for the small individual informal market trader, which can, constitutes 55% of continental Africa's GDP. So I'm very happy to bring you a good news story of where the system is working and where we play our role. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Chinelo? All right, thanks very much, Guy. I'm Chinelo Anohu, and I run the Africa Investment Forum, which is a flagship initiative of the African Development Bank alongside um, seven other fa uh, founding partners, some of which include uh, the AfriExim that I've seen today and the Af AFC, Islamic Development Bank, EIB, Africa 50. And um, basically it's a multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder panel. Uh, ex started to jumpstart and facilitate investment into the continent. And this we do very clearly through a transactional focus where we'd have curate deals, prepare these projects for uh, investment and um, unlock the bottlenecks that surround this investment, be the uh, uh, capital, raise the financing needed, be it policy issues. And, and uh, we do influence policy and uh, negotiate for a level playing field for these investors. And then we track the investments and ensure that financial closure comes sooner than later. And these we do not from uh, just solely a governmental point of view, but also including the private sector, where they both work together and all possible participants to ensure that the deals move closer. And right now we have about 88 projects on our platform. And uh, we have raised uh, the last virtual board meetings we had uh, from deals worth over nearly $60 billion, we raised $32.8 in investment interest. And part of the work we're doing now ahead of our uh, next event in November is to chase up those commitments and make sure that they actually materialize into the transactions. Thank you. Thanks very much. Over to you, Charles. Um, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charles Morito. I lead government affairs and public policy at Google in Africa. Um, for the purpose of this conversation, I think it makes sense to talk about what Google is doing on the continent, focusing on three main areas. The first one is around products, really looking at how do we create the kinds of products that are useful for the African consumer. Um, so, for instance, we are going to be launching a product development center in Nairobi so that the products really resonate and are relevant to the African consumer. The second piece is looking at programs. And on this particular piece, think about what are the kinds of things we need to do to enable SMBs get their businesses online, to enable the youth have the relevant skills. I know that we've been talking a lot about skills. Um, so that's really around the, the, the programs piece. And then lastly is around investments. So we're out there doing both equity-free and equity-based investments. Um, for instance, we had the uh, renewal of the Black Founders Fund. We all know the challenge that Black founders get in terms of being able to raise the right capital uh, initially. So we have equity-free grants um, on that piece. On the first round, $3 million, uh, we had 
um, those uh, 60 startups. But out of those $3 million initially, we had follow-on capital of $73 million. So that really enables these companies to grow. Um, and in addition to that, we are also investing on an equity base, for instance, in Safe Border or Click First um, to help them continue growing. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much, Charles. Henny, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Gary. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Henny Haymans, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer for DHL Express in Sub-Sahara Africa. I've been with the organization for just over 20 years in a, in a number of different roles. I took on this role about five years ago, and probably in its most simplest form, uh, I have the opportunity and the privilege to look after all 51 uh, countries in which we have a legal presence uh, in the continent. And then also we have a dedicated air fleet uh, across Africa, which comprises of 14 aircraft. Nine of those based up in Nigeria that helps us connect West Africa, and then the rest of them are scattered over Central and uh, Southern Africa. Uh, in, in essence, what do we do? Well, we bring the world to Africa and we take Africa to the world. Uh, we're really very much a purpose-driven organization. We talk about improving lives and connecting people. So, Gary, in short, that's who I am and that's what we do. That's all. Just 51 out of 51 countries. That's impressive. Um, thanks, everyone. And I just wanted to set a framework. We're obviously talking about demographic dividends and harnessing human capital. What is it? What are the key framework numbers? Well, Africa has a population of 1.2 billion people, sub-Saharan Africa, and that's growing to 2.2 billion by 2050. Uh, that's an extra billion people. And over 70% of that population are under the age of 30. Um, it's, these are mostly informal economies. Most of the countries, more than half of those countries are informal, entrepreneurs, traders, farmers, and 60% of the population live on smallholder farms and relying on the product, product from that farm to earn a living. There's a shortage of protein, generally, particularly East Africa and West Africa. If we want to develop um, these populations, um, we need to remove stunting in children under the age of five. It's caused by um, you know, not enough protein. And uh, in, in East Africa, it's around about 30% of children. Most of West Africa is similar sort of size. There's short infrastructure shortfalls in capital. So that's what we'll be discussing today. But given that demographic framework, my first question is, um, we're sitting in London. Why does it matter to people, companies, governments in Europe or, or North America, how, we, how Africa harnesses its talent and uh, builds the economies. What, what does it matter? Why, why would you even need to discuss this? So maybe, Charles, I thought I'd start off with you to discuss. And I'd ask any of the panel welcome to, to chip in on any of these questions. Thanks, Charles. Yeah. Th thank you so much. I think that's such an important question, the mm -hmm. so what. Um, we're here talking about um, the demographic dividend and what it means for the world. At the end of the day, we must really think through what Africa is going to represent over the next 28 years and the next um, 78 years, 2050 and at the turn of the century. The, the top five most populous countries on the continent are going to have 1.6 billion people at the turn of the century. China will be at about 700 million. Mm -hmm. So Africa, in essence, is the only place whereby as we look forward, the population is growing as opposed to receding like most other parts. Nigeria alone will be the twice the size of the US today. So we must really start thinking about food security, about the human capital in terms of skill sets, because the problems that that may cause if we do not solve for them will not be Africa's problems. They're going to be global issues. So we really need to start thinking about how we can be able to harness that. And there's a couple of things that we've been looking at as Google, uh, as well as McKinsey and Alphabeta, in terms of thinking, how do you accelerate the economic growth of the continent? And there are four key areas. The first one is around physical capital. How are we investing in the continent to ensure that the continent is connected well enough so that people can access the internet. We've already seen that the power of the internet by 2025 can add an additional $3.4 trillion from a continental perspective. I apologize because I will speak about Africa as a country. I know many people think about it and say it is not a country. If we start splitting it up 
too much, it does not make the economic sense. So we must look at it um, as one, as Strive was talking about earlier. The second piece is around human capital, which is this particular panel. How do we ensure that the youth coming out of Africa can be able to service the world? What's interesting is that by 2050, more than a third of the world's workforce is going to be in Africa. And later on, we can delve a little bit more on that. But there's such great potential of Africans serving the world right from the continent. And the economic impact of that is massive. Then the last two pieces is policy, ensuring that we have the right policy frameworks. It was great hearing the Minister of Trade from Tanzania talking about that. But we must look at it truly from a continental perspective, looking at the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. I know that Secretary General Mene was here earlier. We've been having these conversations of how do we really unite that. And then lastly is technological adoption. I know Mo was talking about agriculture, um, but when I think about agriculture, it needs to be technologically adopted. Every single sector of society has to adopt technology, not really because tech matters that much, but as an enabler to solve for health, for education, for agriculture, and for really every single sector of, of the economy. Thank Thanks you. very much, Charles. Mm. Um, so I, it's obviously important. It's key, and it's important. Um, now, in many of these countries, um, you know, over half the population are in the informal sector. What are the solutions? How do we support the entrepreneurs, the workforce, the companies uh, in, in Africa? And perhaps uh, we'll hand over to you, Wayne, just to talk a little bit about some of the, the ways that you've done that. Sure. Thank, thanks, Gary. So we, we are, um, if I can say this, we're, we're walking the talk. We're a very proud B Corporation. If you're not familiar with the B Corporation movement, I would strongly encourage you to Google it um, today. Um, B or Benefit Corporations uh, are of the view that business is a force for good. And it challenges the idea that um, by going through an ESG greenwashing box ticking exercise, you're leaving you know returns on the table for optical purposes. That's that's something we profoundly disagree with. By actually placing customer success at the heart of what you do, by looking after your staff, by looking after your uh, market conduct and stewarding the resources around us, you actually become a more profitable and a better business. And so our purpose as a business is to unlock people's potential. And our mission is to grow their business with capital and knowledge. So, so how do we solve this problem? Well, we give them micro loans using mobile money and we blend it with micro lessons which are accessible on terms which work for them. The loans are right-sized on the terms for their businesses. Their lives are extraordinarily hard. But speaking to the prior question, why does it matter? Because this is the growth opportunity for the global economy. Africa has always been incredibly important to the global economy. Um, it's in incredibly important to the world's ecology. It provides one of the two massive lungs of the planet, if you look at Africa's forested areas alongside Latin America. So this is a place which matters profoundly to all of our futures. And the challenges which are faced are enormous commercial opportunities. So in addition to providing the microloans and the enterprise knowledge so that these businesses can grow with the ways and the means to succeed, we also are in the process of giving them the digital tool set. So an application, a super app, where they can run their business on a small, affordable device. And we're talking to your colleagues in Nairobi about how we might be able to work together on that so that we can bring the informal trader into the connected economy on a pathway toward formality so that they can engage and make contributions to the integrated states, as well as benefit from being part of countries' SDG pathways towards being able to deliver the results and the goods and the services that people need. So um, I'm not going to be so glib as to say fintech is the future. I'm going to say that in the 21st century and beyond, technology is just a fact of life. It's the bricks and mortars. Mm. What we need to get right is the product design around the client's needs. We need to be very, very mindful about how we design this technology, particularly with AI, and we're very, very hot on AI ethics and technology ethics. 
Because if you don't design for success, and if you don't design for responsible behavior, then you go towards some very, very nasty unforeseen consequences and risks. So the reality is that there are good news stories out there. We're very proud to play our part to provide this digital connective tissue to connect the economy. Um, and we're on the march. So brands and distributors who wish to improve their performance, please talk. We're currently very active in Kenya and Uganda and looking to move further afield. Thanks very much, Wayne. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the disruptions caused through COVID on uh, shipping, port, airlines, and so on. Um, the increased costs of exporting, and that's really held back a number of entrepreneurs uh, and uh, businesses. Um, perhaps, Henny, could you talk a little bit about that and where, where do you see things now and how long do you think these disruptions will continue? And then perhaps we'll talk to Janela about how, what the ways, what solutions there are in fixing some of these problems longer term. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so, so a couple of things. If I, if I look at, at the African continent pre-COVID, we already had a connectivity problem into Africa. Most of the major cities in Africa were connected by one flight a week pre-COVID. Now, that also plays a role in terms of the belly capacity that you have available to bring freight uh, in, into the continent, hence the reason for us establishing our own aviation network. Suddenly, COVID happens, and, and we all know what was one of the first things that happened is commercial airlines all got grounded. What did it mean for us, particularly in Africa, is it meant that we lost a huge amount of belly capacity, in other words, to bring freight in. Then we had all of the delays in ports. We know that what happened in China and Hong Kong and the approach they took, so they had these enormously strict uh, lockdowns, and that further exacerbated the lack of capacity. We then go through COVID and everybody kind of makes a plan and they bring in aircraft and, 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 and we bring trade back to the continent and we, we help to kickstart it. And then you go post-COVID and you say, Okay, so how much of that belly capacity is returned to the continent? And unfortunately, not a lot. What you did see during COVID is that a lot of the regional airlines, unfortunately, didn't resurface uh, after COVID. A couple of knock-on effects from a business point of view. One is, again, you're back to the issue around connectivity and how do you connect Africa intra-Africa? We heard people earlier on talk about intra-Africa trade. And of course, how do you connect Africa to the rest of the world and, and vice versa? So, so that's one element that you sat with. All of a sudden, the world started moving to e-commerce during COVID. Well, what, what was the impact of that? We, we all, everybody in this room has bought something um, on, online. The moment you've made that emotional commitment, you want your shipment tomorrow. So suddenly you move the, the mode of transport from, from shipping to air freight. You suddenly saw an enormous shift in the requirement for capacity from Asia into the Americas. And that meant that the available aircraft that you had suddenly got re realigned and, 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 and uh, re kind of uh, assigned, if you want. You then throw in what's happening in Europe at the moment. You've got the war between Ukraine and, and, and Russia. And, you know, I don't know how many people re realize, but, you know, a pilot, if you give a pilot a map and an aircraft, they try and fly the most direct route to their destination. All of a sudden, coming out of Asia, you can't do that. So you've got to kind of circle around. That adds 45 minutes to, to the average flight. Now, you can go and do the calculations in terms of what that means in terms of additional jet fuel that gets burned, the impact on, on crew time, availability of crew time. Because remember, during COVID, lots of, the, lots of crew uh, were retrenched and found themselves alternative um, uh, jobs. So it's, it's quite complicated at the moment. Just, just really briefly, how do I see it play out? I unfortunately think we're probably going to see this for the next 18 to 24 months. Uh, I think we're still going to see supply chains being throttled uh, to some extent. I think in Africa, we'll definitely see it being exacerbated. Africa as a continent is a net importer, which means there's very little that goes back on aircraft. It means that you fly fresh air. It's an expensive exercise. So uh, I hope I've kind of answered the question yes, thanks, to Annie. some extent. Thanks, Annie. Um, Janello, in your introduction, you, you very quietly said that you've closed over 30 billion of deals you're working on, uh, over 60. And looking at your, your website and materials, it's extraordinary. The, the African Investment Forum has closed. It's, it's only set up in 2018, yet it's closed deals of over 170 billion. And that's through the pandemic. And there's an average a billion per deal. I mean, that's just absolutely extraordinary. The rest of us were at home during the pandemic learning how to make sourdough. You, you placed 170 billion of deals. I mean, that's extraordinary. Perhaps could you tell us some examples and the sort of infrastructure 
investment that's needed and that you're, you are supporting um, going into Africa. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I just need to make a point of correction because you oh, see sorry. this all the time. Uh, the deals closed are different from deals, investment, interests expressed. Two yeah. different things. Yes, yeah, sure. And um, what we have put on the table is the amount of interest, which is remarkable given the downturn in the economy and given the semi apathy sometimes that you find in the investments in the African continent. So I just need to make that clarification yeah. that the deals are not closed. For closure, especially on the Africa Investment Forum, we deal with a whole gamut of requests and there is none we turn away. And part of the things that come to our platform, we call them the ask. Mm -hmm. People come to us for different things. Mm -hmm. And they come to our platform before we onboard you to the platform. You have to say what it is you need our help for. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's raising capital. Sometimes it's, uh, mm -hmm. and what kind of capital? Sometimes it's debt. Sometimes it's equity. And sometimes they have all the capital they need, but they have a bottleneck and it's a policy bottleneck and it's mm -hmm. not moving. Mm -hmm. And they like us to have that intervention with those who matter and those who are able to uh, make the difference in those transactions. And sometimes it's more of uh, visibility so that people are aware of the transaction that they are in and the benefits they can bring across the 54 countries. So rather than knocking on 54 doors, they knock on our door and then we open it for them. And we open it based and we're able to do that from the strength of the partnership we have and both the founding partners and the institutional partners. So since inception, we started in 2018, and of course with the COVID, but even during the COVID, what we have is giving back the ask. I saw um, a lady in the earlier on, she was one of our promises made, I think Tukumbo Ishmael, I don't know if she's still around. She was one of our promises made, promises kept. Because what we do at the forum is to start up something and ensure that we follow it through, that it delivers value to the project sponsors the owners of the business. And um, that's just uh, on the African. I just wanted to make that clarification so um, we're clear. Uh, but going further in terms of uh, how the investments that uh, can uh, utilize, I think, which you mean this whole demographics, which largely are embedded in the informal structure. And I think what we have seen very clearly is a reversal of dependencies uh, in the continent. Right now, what we see on the deals we have on our platform is it's not more so much as sitting back and expecting it to be done, but so much as forging a partnership with equal um, efforts on the table. There are domestic resources to be mocked up, and there are some of them largely ignored. And what we see now, especially as a fallout of the pandemic, is that we're constantly looking inward. And the people we're engaging with now outside of the continent are those who are interested in partnership. Yes. And partnership in a manner that ensures um, a symbiotic return for all the parties involved. Not yes. one is missing out. And that is the, what we see continuously. You mentioned the export. And the COVID was a wake-up call for the continent yes. because it brought clearly to us just how dependent the continent is on, uh, um, on imports. Um, I was at a panel, uh, a closed door panel um, earlier on in the pandemic and uh, a couple of government's uh, officials were discussing how to subsidize the um, import uh, duties so that more could come in. And some of us in the room were screaming that this isn't what we need. Right. We need those um, manufacturing on the continent. Mm -hmm. And that is what will affect the demographics more. Mm -hmm. And that is what will affect the clear movement of the continent from a dependency to a highly productive one. Mm -hmm. And that is what we utilize this huge youth population. Because it's not uh, whether we're looking for traffic in terms of uh, the numbers. We do have the numbers and they're set to increase. And the, one of the things we're working on in the knowledge pillar section of the AIF is actual data. Because what you see is extremely approximated. Mm -hmm. the, there is no actual because you don't know. You don't record all the births on the continent. You don't record all the deaths. So you keep approximating. And sometimes it's far off the mark. Mm 
Mm. So part of the things we undertake now is to start the work. It will not be immediate, but we'll get there to make sure. And I think uh, President Orama alluded to that in his statement earlier, so that we get a, um, as definitive as possible with the figures. But the point I'm making is this investment is needed. Infrastructure, yes, but more in human infrastructure. There are, you're talking about jobs. It's not job creation. Mm. It's equipment mm. of the youth, of the uh, informal sector, of the women, the men. They have to, and once you equip them, you don't need to create jobs for them. They do it for themselves yeah. because they have the skills. I saw someone who was locked down with her ailing father in, in the village, and she was making more than the gentleman who was an ED in a bank in the continent. Mm -hmm. Why? Because she was a virtual assistant. The only thing she invested in was broadband. And she was virtual assistant. She walked around the clock. And when you look at the figure she was earning, and this is what she was able to do during COVID because people were not moving. Mm -hmm. And those are the things we're working on, how to equip. Yes, of course, there's need for basic infrastructure. But I prefer a situation where our focus goes into the human infrastructure. Because once you make that equipment, then a lot of the problems we're even dealing with will be solved because they are not lacking in talent, in intellect. What they're lacking in is the uh, enabling environment for those youths. Mm -hmm. so, thank you very much. Thanks, Janine. Um, I mean, no, no, that's, yes. I think it, it, it's just a huge point you brought up. And maybe, Charles, I could ask you to comment on what sort of skills do you think should be developed to really generate growth in Africa following on to Chinella's point? Yeah. I, I definitely wanted to pick up on Chinella's point about the human capital side of it. But I see it as a much broader issue, and I'm going to start it at the very basic, which I think you touched on um, earlier, at the food production level. Because when we start thinking about the way we're building up the talent uh, we have to think about the early childhood development and making sure that from that particular point, you have people who can actually learn and go through the school system with the capacity you touched on stunting. It's really a massive problem. So we have to think about food security and we have to think about the right price points in terms of food being able to um, capture the right of uh, nutrients that go into those children at an early stage so that as they're going through primary school, high school, and also technical and vocational training um, colleges, you have people who can actually be able to go through that process uh, with the capacity, the mental capacity to learn and to keep that. If I ask the simple question, if all of us here did not have breakfast and lunch, right now you'd be dozing off because you cannot concentrate. And just think about it for a five-year-old child and what they must have to deal with. Um, so thinking about lunch for schools programs, a lot of people are now starting to think that if you're going to build good school systems, you must also think about how you're going to feed those children so that they can be able to learn and then build that all the way up. Um, talking more uh, broadly on the point of what kind of skill sets, I think it's twofold. I think it's really thinking about the university college uh, piece, but also the technical and vocational training. Um, I will focus more on the digital side of things, which interestingly, last year, we did a survey together with Accenture and found that there's about 720,000 certified developers on the continent. What's interesting, two data points that are interesting about that is that a third of those developers are self-taught. But the other piece is that 38% of those developers are working for companies outside the continent. So it goes back to that point of saying Africa can serve the world from Africa. And the anecdote I want to give is of a place, uh, a school called or a program called Learning Lions in Lodwa in Trukana in Kenya whereby this gentleman, Ludwig, has been training high school leavers. And in your mind, when I say high school leavers, you're thinking 17, 18-year-olds who are leaving high school. In Trukana, they are 22 to 24 years old because pastoralism is the first priority, not going to school. But what Ludwig has been doing is teaching them the basic digital things, such as web design, graphic design, things that you can do virtually. 
and people in Lodwa are now doing virtual jobs using platforms um, in Kenya, there's Ajira and there's Fiverr, etc. But through technical elements, you mentioned um, the, the, the piece of fintech, through PayPal into M-Pesa, people are getting paid in Lodwa. They don't need to leave Lodwa to go into a capital city and live in right. um, informal settlements. And I think that we need to start driving more of these skill sets driving more of those opportunities. So I think it's both a human capital, but we cannot speak about human capital in isolation, leaving out the technological access to the internet, um, the school, the food programs. It really has to be broad-based. Um, but you know, it's a massive task to tackle. But as the Africans in the room know, how you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. So let's really start tackling it one small bite at a time and you'll get there. Thanks very much. Uh, perhaps, Wayne, um, obviously a lot of skills developments, uh, if you're helping young entrepreneurs how to manage capital, get access to fairly priced capital, what sort of training support do you give for the, you know, the thousands of people that you are supporting? Well, it's, it's, it's a great segue, and, and I, I really loved your last answer, that this is a lot more than just STEM and, and tech, 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 and maths and coding, because not everybody can do tech and maths and coding. And even if you can you still have to understand how the world works and understand human geography and what you know, my generation used to call a liberal education, that, that you really have the, the full rounded picture. So that, that is a critical foundation. And it's a big part where you know, governments and, and enterprise need to cooperate. We can't eat more than one bite of the elephant ourselves. So we, we just laser focus on doing one thing really, really well. And that's growing small businesses. Um, and so the enterprise training that we deliver is, it's really very basic, but it, it does in its own small way help to address the, 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 the adult education gap because our clients are incredibly resilient. They are really ingenious, really innovative. Uh, they're, they're CEOs in their own right. Um, and so we have this peer to peer relationship, but we, you know, help them where they weren't able to stay in full time education. So record keeping budgeting, planning, client centricity, diversification. I mean, very often you'll see you know, 10 or 15 or 20 mum and bogus, wonderful ladies who form the backbone of all countries, societies and economies. And they'll all be selling tomatoes together in a row and they'll all go to the same wholesaler and buy and they'll, they'll all buy onto the, sell onto the consumer themselves. And actually with a little bit of diversification, suddenly they can start lifting from a survival footing to wealth creation footing. So how to save, how to plan, how to start thinking for the long term. And um, we collaborate with our clients on this training content. So it's pretty much all proprietorial. We create it ourselves, but we work with our clients. What do you need to learn? And they tell us. So we have 24-7 real-time feedback with our clients on what is it that they need how can we design around those needs? How can we package it? Um, and so the, the manner that training is delivered is very important as well. So whilst we are a fintech, we also have relationship officers who mm -hmm. can do the face-to-face -face stuff, micro lessons, five to 15 minutes. But they can also access the training and the knowledge through tweets that we send them or our YouTube digital channels or through social media or through uh, an IVR hotline, or they'll phone us up and they'll get the lesson of the day kind of thing. So it's a big area of investment that we're making at the moment. We recently closed our Series C uh, equity round earlier this year, and, and, and a fairly significant portion of that is going towards enriching the training content because that helps them become better businesses. Mm -hmm. So it is, um, it is much in our own commercial interest because mm -hmm. then they repay the loans and our repayment rates are mm -hmm. industry leading. Our default rates are, you know, sort of uh, uh, around the, the five to seven percent mark, which for instant access unsecured credit is uh, you know, not the norm. Um, and we've been doing this for a while. So, so the uh, the combination of that training and the manner in which it's delivered, designed around the client's need, is kind of how we do it. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and just find maybe Henny, just to talk a bit about your dear is a world class transportation company, trying to to deliver stuff very quickly on time and you're working across 51 countries what sort of training how do you achieve that what do you have to do with people to get to that to that high level of standard 
Oh, Gary, I think the thing that has made DHL successful is this common culture that, that we have across the world, uh, 228 plus uh, countries and territories. And, and, and it was lovely, I heard somebody earlier on talking about, you know, the people as the first pillar of their, of their strategy. And it's, it's no different uh, for us at DHL. And in fact, if you look, to the, look at the history of DHL, uh, you know, the late 2000, 2008, 2009, to where DHL find itself now in a, in a, in a pretty good position, is all attributable to the way in which we've approached, treat, um, and, and educate our own staff. You know, with that comes a pride, with that comes a, a certain sense of responsibility. There's a passion that comes with it. And if I have to break it down, probably the most important part of it is, is having a purpose that your people believe in. That's the first thing. And the second thing is if they understand what their role is in executing that purpose, making that purpose real. And that's the beauty of, of our organization because you can execute on that purpose anywhere in the world and regardless of the title that you have. So whether you're a cleaner at the airport facility, whether you sit in the corner office as a CEO. So I think, I think that's, that's the internal part for us. I just want to quickly pick up uh, on, on some of the comments here. I think, you know, often people say, you know, what's the one thing I would change about Africa? How, how would we help Africa trade to prosperity? If you just look at the number of SMEs, that exist across Africa. And, and funny enough, it's one of the areas as a vertical where we as DHL since COVID have seen enormous growth come through is through the SME channel. There's about 44 million SMEs across Africa. And if you just do the maths real quickly, if, every, if we can as, as, as the world help any one of those SMEs just create one more job opportunity, just, just one, we've suddenly created 44 million job opportunities. If we get all of those SMEs to register and pay their due taxes, and if you just make a simple calculation, you say each one of those just pay $100 in annual taxes, just $100. You, you can do the maths. So I think one of the, the, the most powerful things we sit on in Africa as a continent is the power of the SMEs. And if we can get those SMEs to start trading beyond their borders mm. and demystify that process, I, th I think that'll be an enormous enhancement to where Africa find itself. You know, we, we heard earlier on, um, previous guests spoke about intra-Africa trade, which is around 17% versus Europe at 60 and the Americas at 50. If we can just get the SMEs in Africa just to trade beyond their borders, and that's what we concentrate our training on, is to say, how do we demystify this? How do we declutter that? If we can get that right, we will see a massive uptick in, in Africa's position. Thanks, Henny. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but are there any questions from the audience? Um, anyone want to talk about demographics and how we can harness our demographic dividend in Africa? Any questions for the panel? There's one I, I did want to ask Janello, which is just um, on, on the ICT side, obviously we, we've seen how important it is. But what sort of projects uh, have you seen on the ICT side uh, we've been involved in? Um. Thank you. Um, I think, I'm not sure that we focus on our platform, just yeah. a, a project called ICT. If I know it's a range. Yeah, of, you look at energy and yes, I know yes, it, yes. It, it what works, we but see, just on the ICT. Yes, what we see is a lot of the projects now leveraging yes. uh, the, info, right. uh, the technology field. I'll give you an example. We had a, a telemedicine uh, project on our platform, which was a concept in 2019. Fast forward to the COVID period. And what we have is that very quickly, nobody wanted to go to the hospitals. And sometimes nobody was even allowed to go to the hospitals. And this telemedicine took a quantum leap. And we found out that there needed to be more investment in the uh, technology aspect of it, because that's what they were able to reach uh, the underserved areas. So we, and then you saw, we also have a project on our platform that is dealing uh, solely with the broadband and the last mile issue yeah. and how, and what we try to do, and uh, this is to the point raised repeatedly on harnessing the numbers so that it counts. We deal with uh, Africa as a whole, yeah. perhaps regionally, Western region, Eastern region, but when we are working at projects, we give priority to those who are going beyond one country. And we always look at how these projects will scale. So even if they were to start, for instance, in Kenya, we need to see what you plan to do in the West Africa. Right. You need to see what we plan to do in South Africa. We need to see, and these are the markers where we judge before you are onboarded. So it's a focus on having a regional approach, a continental approach so that we can scale. And one thing I didn't hear 
that I think we should also put on the table in terms of harnessing the demographic difference is the, the creative industry. Right. Yeah, it's, it's huge. And um, I'm particularly proud of the work the Africa XM is doing on the creative industry side. They've gone right to the heart of the matter at scale, uh, individually, and they consciously harness this talent and improving them. Const uh, right now, we're working on uh, a film academy project on our platform, and the Africa Exam is uh, at the forefront of that, and including um, a very uh, high ra highly rated school here in the UK. But what it is is also to provide that alternative training that we are not all going to be talented in the same way. And uh, how do we harness all of the talents, which you find a comparative advantage on the continent when it comes to the creative industry, when it comes to the entertainment industry, the music industry? How do we harness that? The Film Academy seeks to equip the skills. If you look at a lot of the filmmaking in the continent, it's good, but it could be better in terms of the training on the cinematography, the training on how you harness the whole lighting, the props that make a film what it is. Use Putting that on the continent, which is what we're working on now, certainly changes the equation. The same with sports. Many African countries, are, uh, and um, uh, Nigeria, for instance, are reclassifying sports as a recreation. It's now reclassified as a business, and it's a totally different uh, attitude. And these are the ones you look at the merchandising, the harnessing of the talents, the teaching of how to protect their IPs long after they are not able to play the sports. So yeah. these are the markers, and we are seeing them not um, theoretically. We're seeing them by transactions on the platform. Oh. So when we're working to make that happen, we also are clear what the impact will be on the continent. Thanks, Janello. Well, I'm going to wrap up there and uh, just like to say very, very much uh, strong thank you to everybody. That was just excellent, very insightful from all four of you, and uh, give them a big hand. Thanks, everyone.